commencer. Bonjour, hein. Bonjour à tous. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this colloquium. Uh, I will say a few words. So as you know, uh, as you may have noticed, the last four days, uh, EAP has been hosting the EPRO-8 conference, which is a conference devoted to the physics of uh, relativistic art flows. And therefore, we thought that it could not be more fitting for this week's colloquium to welcome the Professor Feriad Ozel from Georgia Tech, the Georgia Institute of Technology. And uh, she's a, a very renowned uh, scientist in the physics of uh, compact objects neutron stars in particular, and also a leading member of the EHT Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. Um, so Ferial Ozel obtained her PhD at Harvard under the guidance of uh, Ramesh Narayan on the physics of, uh, on the emission properties of neutron stars, but also on the physics of accretion flows. Then she moved on a Hubble uh, fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and then uh, have been uh, holding a professorship at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And recently, although I don't know exactly when, you moved to, a year? Okay, a year ago, you moved to Georgia Tech, where you're now the department chair, right? So as I said, uh, you're a very renowned scientist because you have made decisive contributions in the physics of compact objects, in particular on neutron stars, where you have been able to obtain um, uh, exquisite constraints on the mass and radius of neutron stars using X-ray data, and therefore you've been able to constrain the equation of state of dense nuclear matter. And in recognition of these achievements, you've been awarded the 2013 uh, Maria Goeppert Mayer Prize of the American Physical Society. And then, uh, you, as I said, you've also been very much interested in the physics of accretion flow, so you're a member of the EHT collaboration, which obtained collectively the uh, 2020 Breakthrough Prize uh, for obtaining the first image of a supermassive black hole. And this is the topic of your colloquium today, so which is entitled, uh, We Got Black Hole Images, Now What? So you will tell us a bit more about the physics behind the scene and maybe the perspectives in that field. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me here. Thank you to the organizers of both the conference that, that I just attended, which was a wonderful four days, and for the colloquium. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, I, on purpose, chose a little bit of a provocative title because I'm sure a lot of you, or all of you, have seen the first images of black holes from the center of our galaxy and from the M87. Uh, galaxy, uh, center of the M87 galaxy. But um, we are physicists and we, we love discovery, but we also like to understand what we learned from it. Um, so it's not just pretty pictures. It is, what do we learn about compact objects? What do we learn about gravity? What do we learn about plasmas? What do we learn about accretion flows? So um, I would like to introduce you to the um, and I know this is a diverse audience that uh, spans anything from extrasolar planets to general relativity. Um, so I would like to tell you a little bit about the workings of the Event Horizon Telescope, how we make the images. And based on that, I will focus mostly on theoretical and computational work that allowed us to derive physics constraints from them. So, um, this is just a rendition of the way the Event Horizon Telescope array looked in 2018. Since then, we have added more stations, actually one in the French Alps. So it is um, the array is growing. But the key point here is that calling it a telescope is a misnomer. It's, of course, an array that connects telescopes. Do I have a pointer, actually, that I can? Use or no, okay, no. Ah, okay, this, this is more fun actually, thank you. Um, the key point here is that the array connects points that are, that uh, cover the globe from the South Pole to the Greenland Telescope, practically at the North Pole, uh, from the uh, Atacama Desert in Chile to LMT in 
Mexico to two telescopes in Arizona and to IRAM and now NOEMA in Europe and um, two telescopes in Hawaii. So um, the technique is called very long baseline interferometry. And what that does is enable us to gather data with multiple telescopes that are not physically connected to one another and record the data and time tag the arrival of each wave front with enough precision. So we have hard drives, we have hydrogen maser clocks. This is our black hole emitting. And these are telescopes that are um, far, far apart on Earth. And by recording the data faithfully, including all the noise and everything, and then correlating it, basically it's a multiplication of signals that allows you to determine a time delay of arrival between the two points. You can match it up and get the angular resolution that you would have had from a telescope as if it was the size of the globe. Obviously the collecting area is a lot less, but it allows you to um, get um, pieces of the image. To go into it in a tiny bit more detail, what this does is every pair of telescopes at any instant in time gives us a Fourier component of the two dimensional image. So um, this is the what we call spatial frequencies in the north-south direction and the east-west direction. And this particular, oh, thank you. I was having fun with this. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> so each pair of telescopes is going to give us the Fourier component, um, which is the vector that is aligned with our line of sight. Um, so. I'm sorry, not the line of sight, the, the baseline, the separation as it's projected onto the sky. And the component is going to be the separation divided by the wavelength of observations. We do our observations at 1.3 millimeters to 130 gigahertz. Recently, we've expanded to a shorter wavelength as a, as a trial stage. But of course, this is not going to give you an image. This is a single component, the Fourier component of an image. So we do two things. We rely on the rotation of the Earth so that each pair draws out a track instead of giving you a single point. And of course, other com uh, combinations of telescopes come in. So it becomes n choose two uh, stations that are, uh, or locations covered on the UV plane and each one of them gets partially filled um, at, the, at the end of a whole night of observation. But if you look here, it's still a pretty sparse coverage, but you would say sparse interferometry. And the reason is, of course, um, you can't in directly invert this into an image. You still have to fill in the missing information up to the resolution that you have on your longest baseline. <clears throat> so, that's our technique, um, but uh, what, are the, what are the sources that are available to us and why did we choose 1.3 millimeters? And this goes back to the work that I have done uh, back in 2000 with uh, colleagues at Harvard when we were first starting to think about imaging the horizons of black holes in order to understand whether we could have observational proof of their uh, of their uh, event horizons and particular properties. And um, this is the um, this is based on the uh, image on the left. The plot on the left is based on the first type of uh, simulations of black hole environments that are appropriate for the types of objects that we have in the nearby universe. Sagittarius A star, M87's uh, center, but uh, pretty much all other nearby black holes accrete in a mode that we call now a low luminosity AGN or radiatively inefficient flow. Um, the reason is that the mass accretion rates are pretty low and the flow is radiatively inefficient. So um, back, uh, back in 2000, we started understanding the characteristics of those flows enough to say, uh, what the image size would be at different frequencies, and at what point would it 
<clears throat> be close enough to the to the event horizon so that we could see the light illuminating the the shadow um, at the center of the horizon uh, at the center of the of the uh, object so um as you notice, we identified Sag star. And at the time, I was also looking into X-ray interferometry um, uh, opportunities because there was a Beyond Einstein program in, uh, in the United States um, that allowed us to think about um, like high resolution X-ray interferometer from space. And we identified M87 as the other target. On this plot, as you can see, um, we're looking at resolvable size and the distance of the source from us, and Sag star and M87 being the lowest two uh, on this plot are the ones that where you can resolve the best um, with, with a given aperture. So when we said these are the best targets, the angular size is still 50 micro arc seconds. These are tiny, tiny objects. And of course, that's why we need the very long baseline interferometry. So we identified, um, especially in this paper, the need to go to uh, 1.3 millimeters in order to resolve the event horizon. So um, it took a long time to put together the array. This is the result. Um, that we obtained uh, as, uh, um, at the end of our observing campaign in 2017. Again, showing you the Fourier space, color-coded tracks um, between pairs uh, obtained from pairs of telescopes. Um, this is the M87 data. Um, the, <clears throat> the left is already what I showed you, but let's say for the sake of the moment that we're not interested in a two-dimensional image, Let's collect all of this into a single plot just based on the, uh, the distance of the baseline and plot the amplitude of the visibility, uh, the, the Fourier uh, um, amplitude, as a function of the spatial frequency, which is the baseline length in um, giga lambda here. So what you're seeing here is that when you collect all of this, there is this characteristic ringing uh, in the data. The structure of the data immediately tells you that it's a compact source. It, in effect, what we are saying is that this is a Bessel function, and Bessel, fu Bessel function is a Fourier transform of a compact source. It doesn't mean that it's a ring-like source, but it tells you uh, what the size of the source is. And in particular, um, the first uh, the location of this first minimum tells you what the size is. But before I do that, let me show you the SAJ star data, its coverage during the 2017 observing campaign. And again, we do the same thing, visibility amplitude as a function of baseline. You see this characteristic ringing structure. So that right there tells you that we're looking at an object that's about uh, 52 micro arc seconds in size. And the rest of the ringing pattern tells you whether you have a disc-like or a ring-like structure. So even without doing much analysis at all, just by looking at this, you can um, already um, say that you end up have, having to have a ring-like structure that is of order 50 micro arc seconds, 52 micro arc seconds, okay? So that's why the data themselves speak for most of it, but in order to extract something more from it, we're going to need the theoretical simulations. How do we actually, how did we actually make the images in our first series of, um, of uh, tools, our first set of tools? Well, um, I'm going to show you a pixel-based model where you divide up the image space into all of these pixels. They're, uh, they all are, uh, are um, allowed to have a particular brightness. But as you can see, this is all the data that you have. And this is many, many more degrees of freedom. So n pixels, n squared degrees of freedom, you can independently constrain them. So we use something called 
a regularized maximum likelihood method. What that means is that you put some constraints on what the image can and can't be, how fast it can vary, how sharp it can be. So this is from computer vision, regularized maximum likelihood existed before that. Effectively, you're not only trying to uh, minimize the chi-squared data minus model, but you're adding to it a weight uh, times multiple regularizers about what you allow the image to be. And that allows you to settle on a solution. So I'll just show this to you. The trial image, um, uh, all the brightnesses in the pixels are allowed to vary. And as you can see, it went from a pretty bad chi-squared to one that what we're showing here is the north, south, and east, west cross sections of the image and um, that uh, they reproduce the data quite well. And that's how we ended up with the first image of, um, of M87 that I'm sharing with you here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what are the image elements? Now let's look at SciJ star and M87 together. Same methodology was applied to both, um, of course. SciJ star is, is a little different in the sense that it's a smaller black hole. The dynamical time scale around it is, uh, is therefore shorter. And it's also um, in, the in the center of our galaxy. So we're looking through the galactic disk to, to get at it. So it took a couple more years of analysis to understand the effects of scattering within the galaxy, as well as um, the um, any uh, complications from the variability of the source, but ultimately they look pretty similar. Um, focusing on M87, um, the brightness depression in the center we identified with the black hole shadow. Here it's apparent, here it's not. There is a north-south asymmetry that comes from the Doppler shift. So in this particular case, we would say that the angular momentum of uh, axis of the um, of the flow would be in this direction so that the bottom is coming towards you. And uh, most importantly, what we are actually seeing is a narrow ring of emission from the surrounding plasma. It is due to the fact that the infalling gas is hot enough to emit synchrotron photons that is allowing us to see, um, like it's illuminating the uh, the gravitational features of the black hole, which we are then seeing imprinted on the image. So from here, I mean, we could say, well, um, here is the size of the ring and we see some evidence of, I mean, certainly an evidence of brightness depression. Uh, we expect that to come from, from the um, event horizon of the of the black hole. And basically we wouldn't have made any quantitative assessment if we just had these images. So basically now what? What, it, what are the steps that we took in order to turn this into some measurements of both the plasma and of the space time? <clears throat> okay. So, um, in order to interpret these images, I'm, I'm going to um, just take a, a step back. I'll divide the talk into three parts from, uh, from this point onward. They are not super long, so don't, don't be scared. Um, the first part is how did we build the simulation tools um, and the image libraries um, that allowed us to interpret what we are seeing? Um, the second part is how confident are we that our models are complete and is there something more to do? Um, have we uncovered any, um, any areas where we don't understand accretion flows uh, well enough? And of course that was partially the, for the last four days in this conference of talking about what it is that we understand about flows and jets um, in black hole environments and in other relativistic environments. And then the third part is actually now that we are armed with all of this, can we make the images that I showed you 
better than what we obtain with the regularized maximum likelihood methods, okay? So um, this is just a um, simulation of magnetic energy um, and thermal energy density. Um, I don't know. It's going to start showing you. It's thinking about it. We'll, we'll let it. We'll let it uh, go. But this is a standard GRMHD simulation from the um, initial NASA TCAN network uh, that uh, that I was a part of. And um, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, the standard procedure is we solve the uh, the equations of magnetohydrodynamics, allowing the magnetic field to to develop along with hydrodynamics in the GR setting. So GRMHD for short. And um, by using these simulations, uh, we explore a variety of initial conditions of feeding the disk, what the initial magnetic field seeds might be like, um, black hole spins, different mass accretion rates. And we try to understand the impact of, of, in, of all of these parameters and initial conditions on how the flow develops and what its uh, properties end up uh, looking like. And of course, we, uh, we want to understand in steady state um, what they look like. So um, we also build tools to connect this to observables. Now, um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples from the new GRMHD simulations before I show you what the image library looks like. As you can see, we can do have standard and normal evolution, magnetically arrested disk, where the magnetic field structures develop differently from different initial conditions. And as I already mentioned to you, we can do different black hole spins, et cetera. So we ran a very large suite of new GRMHD simulations that are appropriate for the conditions around SAJ star and M87. We are interested in its observable properties. So GRMHD by itself is not enough. Um, what we then do is general relativistic radiative transfer, where we map each of these um, simulation volumes at every time step where we, uh, where we sample them into what the image would look like, what the spectrum would look like, what the total uh, emissive, uh, total emission in a particular wave band would look like. So these are, this is the image plane. Um, this is the three-dimensional rendering of the simulation. And these are the paths of photons that we trace back integrating through the, um, through the um, simulation volume to understand what the contribution to, um, to a particular wavelength of light would be. <clears throat> so, having done all of this, um, we, um, we were able to extract certain uh, repeating characteristics of, of images that always show up independent of, almost independent of, what the magnetic field structure is, what the electron temperature is, what the mass accretion rate is within reason. And these have to do with the particular characteristics of the, or the properties of the space time of the black hole that get imprinted on the image. So uh, I know some of you in the, uh, uh, in the audience also worked on this. Um, so um, there are a, part, a few um, characteristics that we can look at. This is the horizon um, at, um, for a, a non-rotating uh, black hole at, uh, 2 gm over c squared. Um, this is the photon orbit at 3 gm over c squared. And this is a photon path. Let's say that I'm interested in how much emissivity I would pick up if I moved along here. Um, and how much light bending uh, would, be, would be experienced. So now if I change this, if I change the impact parameter of this photon path to, from the center of the black hole going out, you're going to see that the amount of deflection that this particular path experiences is going to go through a critical point. So all of a sudden, it's going to have, it's going to start wrapping around the black hole and having much more path uh, 
going from 5M down to the center. And in particular, um, there is going to be a critical point where interior of which it's going to end up inside the black hole. And um, just at that critical path, it's going to have a lot more path length by uh, having the ability to wrap around the black hole because of gravitational light bending. And if I go just a little bit out, this, these are tiny displacements in, um, in the uh, impact parameter. Uh, what it's going to do is um, have a, a lot less of a, uh, of a path. But that's not all. We are dealing with, as I said, low luminosity or radiatively inefficient accretion flows. That's how I started my talk. And one of the key characteristics of these flows is that they are optically thin. And um, the 1.3 millimeter emission that we see is synchrotron emission from hot electrons in the magnetic field. <clears throat> Okay, so it is not sufficient to know what the path length is. It is not like AGN disks where all you need to know is the intensity where you hit the disk and you count one intensity, two intensity, three intensity. It's not, it's not quantized like that. You actually have to pick up the contribution of this emissivity in this optically thin flow as you travel through the path. So this is what a typical intensity as a function of impact parameter looks like as you travel through one of these flows. This is path A. This is the location of path A, where you have traversed a thicker part of the disk. So you might think that you're going to have a brighter image, but also it's a part of the flow where the magnetic field strength and the electron temperature is a little bit lower. So as you travel through, the contributions that you picked up are smaller at each step. So from A to B, when you're moving in, and from B to C, as you're moving in, you're actually becoming brighter. And furthermore, C is now one of these paths that wraps around and picks up a second contribution from the, from the um, farther side of the flow. So this is path C and this is path C. And as you can see, I'm, I'm showing here the critical uh, photon path here uh, where um, it could go around uh, in a circle, a photon could go around in a circular orbit multiple times and it could go into the black hole or uh, reach an observer at infinity. So uh, path C and D, um, this is the contribution from C. There is a little bit of a dip um, because the path length has um, temporarily decreases, but D also has this sharp component. Of course, the resolutions of our telescopes don't allow us to see the C and D separately. Um, and furthermore, it is a continuum. Um, the particular path lengths that we add up together have, have this bump here, but um, the um, we can't say, for example, uh, a path that crosses twice versus three times is, pro is two to three uh, in proportion, okay? So we have to do, uh, we have to do this uh, general relativistic radiative transfer and map it to, uh, to the, um, uh, space time properties. Okay, but this allows us to do several things. One is explore a broad range of conditions where we change all of these parameters, both in GRMHD and after the fact in electron temperature and observer's inclination. What if I'm looking at it face on? What if I'm looking at it edge on? And build a library where where we say, when do I see the shadow at the, at the center? And what are the characteristics of the bright ring of light that I can then quantify with respect to what I know about that black hole given its mass and spin? Okay. So this allows us to do effectively a calibration between the bright part of the image 
where we see the ring, what is its width, what is its, most importantly, what is its size, and compare it with the uh, the space-time signature that we but that we can just calculate for that black hole. But if we're going to use this as a test of general relativity and say, given the mass and the range of spins that I'm allowing, we don't know spin a priori, um, what, what is it um, that I can understand about this, uh, the space-time? You also have to go beyond uh, GR to, to some of the alternatives. And to do that, we built a uh, fully covariant semi-analytic model of uh, black hole accretion flows that, again, solve uh, the equations of mass continuity, momentum, energy conservation, et cetera, uh, follow the geodesics of that particular space-time, and ask for a variety of conditions. Again, just like in GRMHT, I can vary those conditions. The only thing I'm not doing is um, looking at the time variability, but looking at average steady state um, characteristics. And in multiple different metrics, even boson stars, ask ourselves, what is the relationship between the bright ring and, and the hole in the middle, which is what I'm after? The great um, news turns out to be that the key distinguishing characteristic of different gravity models is the size of the ring and the size of the shadow. But they become larger or smaller in tandem. So I can certainly make a larger ring by changing the space-time characteristics for the same mass and spin black hole. But it, it's both its space-time, uh, or its photon ring um, and its shadow are going to move out in tandem. So I can quantify that ratio in alternative metrics to the current metric. <clears throat> Um, to make this a little bit more quantitative, what I'm saying is that this allows us both using GRMHD and this covariant uh, analytical model that allows us to implement many different metrics. It allows us to measure the relationship between the visible things we can measure from the image and the shadow diameter, which is what we are after. Um, I think I have already um, talked to the points on the slide, the relationship turns out to be quite tight. Um, if we define the ratio, um, uh, a ratio alpha uh, between the image and the shadow, and um, of course, uh, for, uh, for Kerr, um, we, we use the analytic approximation for what this D shadow is from the Chan et al. paper, um, where we had derived that analytic approximation. And for non-curve shadows, we uh, numerically calculated the shadow diameter. And this is what it looked like for the GRMHD library, for the MAD and SANE types of simulations that I showed you. The y-axis is the full with half max um, of the image. And the x-axis is that ratio alpha that I mentioned to you, minus one. And as you can see, it is, um, it is very, uh, tightly uh, constrained, uh, both in the um, shadow diameter and that fractional difference. It turns out to be about 1.1, but it doesn't, I mean, effectively, by doing these numerical simulations and numerical experiments, we can quantify this, uh, what this alpha uh, looks like. And when I now show it to you as a histogram, um, the GRMHD curve, analytic curve, and analytic non curve all have this characteristic distribution where it peaks just below 1.1 for alpha, meaning that the ring is always slightly bigger with this uncertainty um, than the shadow diameter. So now if I, if I have tools, of course, uh, we developed uh, tools to quantitatively measure the ring size from, from the images, I can, with its uncertainty, apply this calibration factor to ask what the shadow diameter is. I think I'm going to skip this. Um, this is about the sparse interferometry that I talked about. 
just because I have, I know what that ring is doesn't mean I can measure it um, with, with full fidelity in a sparse interferometer. So we did a lot of blind testing uh, of our different imaging algorithms to say, here is a, um, here is a synthetic image, reconstruct it uh, with your tools, uh, synthetic image meaning what it would look like to the, uh, to the EHD array. Um, we produced those, gave it to uh, imaging groups in order to re reconstruct it and said, what do you think its diameter is? And uh, we also quantified um, and um, calibrated where uh, the way in which different imaging algorithms, this is the ground truth of, the, of a particular synthetic data set and what they measured um, to be the size and, um, <clears throat> and width of that image. So this is another uncertainty. And of course, the two calibrations are multiplied together when determining the error budget in the final, um, final uh, measurements. So um, how am I doing with time? OK, so 10, 15 minutes. Perfect. OK, so um, the. Um, this is our back to the image, one day average image um, of <clears throat> now Sag Sagittarius A star. What I have is this calibration factor between the measured ring diameter and the shadow diameter. And now we're allowing it to deviate from GR through this delta parameter. If delta is zero, and I know the mass of the black hole, to within a few percent plus or minus that comes from the unknown spin, I should get the predicted image diameter on the left. So this is the measured, this is the Schwarzschild diameter, this is the calibration factor that I just described to you through all of that simulation library, and delta is what we are after. These are the various imaging techniques with the priors for the black hole mass and distance that we used from the Keck telescope measurements that um, Nobel Prize, of course, a few years ago, um, measure, measuring the, um, the orbits of stars around Sag A star over a 20 year period allows us to get a very good constraint on the mass to distance ratio of Sagittarius A star. Um, uh, we also did it for gravity priors. So it, it looks very, very similar. And this is the band um, that is consistent with GR because of this um, spin uh, corrections. And um, these are the various combinations of the imaging algorithms with our different calibration parameters from, from these different um, um, simulation um, data sets. And um, so, at this point, we do not see a, any evidence for deviation from general relativity um, at the, at about, um, the uncertainty here is about 10% um, when you combine all of the, all of the errors. Okay, so this is where we are. Um, what can we do better? And did we uncover anything else? That's part two, um, which is going to be much shorter. Are the models adequate and complete? I don't want to give you the impression that we have solved all problems in accretion flows. That's far from true. Um, there are a lot of interesting plasma properties that we haven't even, um, we are just maybe beginning to explore. But what I am saying is that in steady state, independent of what we did to the accretion flow. We were able to uh, derive these constraints for the space time um, within the uncertainties of the plasma um, that, that gave us confidence of our measurements. But when you look at it in more detail, for example, you look at the variability properties of these flows and you say, as I run the simulation, and this is time in hours, and look at the 1.3 millimeter flux measured in Janskis. This is what we expect expected from our simulations. And this is one of the quieter ones that I'm showing you. 
So this is just steady state variability. I'm not looking at a particular flaring event. I'm not looking at some kind of dissipative thing that's happening in the plasma. Our GRMHD simulations are telling us that just due to turbulence and the electrons heating and cooling and our ions heating and cooling um, normally, this is what we should see. But the green band is showing you what we actually observed in the data, okay? This is April 5th, April 6th, April 7th, and April 10th. The flux variations as measured by the some millimeter array and the ALMA array. And as you can see, the RMS variability during that entire observing window is much smaller as shown in this green band here than what we predicted from our GRMHD simulations. So um, you, you might think turbulence is turbulence, but clearly there is something that we are missing about the ion to electron heating or some kind of um, some kind of process that's happening in these flows that is making it quieter during, uh, during normal uh, accretion windows. Now, what this shows here um, is uh, a flaring event. So a true brightening event where the flux as measured in the X-rays goes up to about a factor of a uh, hundred higher. And this is seen routinely from Sagittarius A star with the Chandra X-ray telescope. So those events we can't capture in our standard GRMHD. So when it comes to true flaring events, we underproduce variability. And when it comes to steady state, we overproduce variability. So there are definitely interesting kinetic effects that, uh, that we're going to continue to explore. Um, and one of the things that we've done in this past year is look at whether uh, there are more physically motivated ways of doing it compared to what we have done. So GRMHD solves for the protons only. We don't have a two-fluid uh, two uh, simulation. And we then guess the electron temperature to be a fraction of the proton temperature. But what happens in reality? Well, this is the global simulation scale, um, 10 to the 16, um, let's say four centimeters for Sagittarius A star. This is where I showed you all of the uh, GRMHDN radiative transfer. But the microphysics where we're interested in how energy partitions into ions and electrons happens um, about 12 orders of magnitude and, or sometimes more um, at smaller scales. So there is no way a single simulation is going to be able to bridge this gap. So we've been working on uh, ways of uh, incorporating microphysics simulations into the global simulations to understand this better. But at the same time, um, there are already some gyrokinetic simulations that allow us to understand how the energy cascades from global scales to the, um, to the micro scales. And, in particular, MRI-driven turbulence magnetorotational instability that gives rise to um, accretion flow uh, properties um, has both a compressive cascade, a, a cascade of the compressive waves and the alphane waves from these larger scales, um, and they decouple at a certain um, uh, length scale and then um, propagate down to the ion gyro radius and the electron gyro radius where the heating happens. So we've been able to already incorporate some of this more physically motivated uh, physics into um, the allowing for different ratios of the compressive to alphane um, wave power. And this is the electron heating over the total heating. And this is the range of GRMHD simulations in terms of the plasma beta um, where we are able to now say something a little bit more physically motivated, and we'll see the impact of this in, um, in variability in follow-up work. Okay, um, so the takeaways from this is that GRMHD models get the main features right. Uh, we are able to use it as a calibration tool 
But because they can't capture the dissipative processes that happen at very small kinetic scales, and because we don't solve for the electrons separately, um, we are now looking into electron heating in MRI-driven turbulence um, in order to see whether that will fix the variability problem and uh, how else it might affect the flow. So in the last three minutes, I want to introduce to you a new imaging uh, technique that we developed um, owing to the, um, to the vast uh, modeling work uh, that I described to you. So going from the um, regularized maximum likelihood methods where you say, okay, I'm just going to introduce a bunch of regularizers just like we do in computer vision and um, reconstruct without different algorithmic parameters and see how much of an impact that has on the image. For example, you see that it's not really changing the image size, but it's changing the brightness pattern around this ring. These are all allowable uh, within, uh, within our data. Um, and that's what gives rise to the average images and the morphologies that, um, that we published in the series of Sagittarius A star papers. What if we now use what we know about the images to make a smarter algorithm that allows us to interpolate between those regions where we have data and where the information is missing using a basis that is more conducive to the particular properties that we uh, anticipate from, from um, black hole images? So. Basically, take tens of thousands of simulated images um, and use uh, uh, principal component analysis to break it down into a, a basis or an orthonormal basis set, and then ask ourselves how. And it's, I mean, of course, you could use any kind of polynomial set that you want, but the characteristics of these images, as I showed you in that. Um, in that cross section is that there's a sharp drop off. So if you use Legendre pol polynomials, you would need hundreds of components. And even then you would have the ringing problems that, that we um, typically have. So what if we made our basis set from these variety of images and um, use that eigenbasis and ask ourselves, how well can I reconstruct a snapshot? How well can I reconstruct something that's within my training set? How well can I reconstruct something that is not within my training set? How many parameters, how many components would I need given the signal to noise ratio of, of the Event Horizon Telescope um, to make something meaningful? So with these weights, if I do three components, and this is my example snapshot, and this is the one filtered to the Event Horizon Telescope resolution, this would be, this is what you would recover. With 20 components, this is what you would recover. With 40 components, this is what you would recover. So you're starting to pick up more and more and more features of the original image. And of course, you want to make sure that if a particular image wasn't in your training set, that however components you however many components you choose, you would be able to still get the meaningful. For example, if there wasn't a hole in the center, you want to be able to say there is no hole in the center. So we um, developed this machine learning technique that we called Primo pr uh, principal components um, that um, allowed us to to get to um, this precision with far fewer tools and filling in the missing information in a smarter way than, um, that, than what uh, regularized maximum likelihoods can do. Why does this work? Are we making up stuff where it doesn't exist or are we biasing the, um, the algorithm because we know what we're looking for and therefore it's going to imprint what we already generated in our simulation set. I mean, these are perfectly valid questions. It turns out that 
all the way back to the beginning of the talk, we're dealing with compact images. You already know from the ringing pattern what size you're dealing with. And there are particular characteristics of, of compact images, such as uh, the wavelength of that ringing, where if you knew what types of functions you're dealing with, and you had only a few, few data points, the correlation lengths in the Fourier space would allow you to very smartly guess uh, what, the, what the data points around it should be. In other words, using this algorithm, now this is the UV space again, these are all the tracks that where we do have data, allows you to correctly infer the properties of the image in areas that correspond to these blue blobs that are of size about two giga lambda around the existing data without making anything up, okay? And you can do this for such a large variety of images that your training set and your algorithm learns to, from all of these data, within these correlation lengths, fill in the missing information much more efficiently, okay? And this is why, um, as long as you have a compact image, even if it doesn't have the properties that your ring-like image has in your data, it is able to reconstruct it uh, faithfully. So this is now the um, Primo constructed, uh, 2017 M87 image that is at the EHD resolution. As you can see, we no longer have to blur as much. We no longer have to um, average over so many different trial regularizers that are um, that are allowed because you have, you know, um, you you didn't impose anything else that you know about the image. And um, this is the new machine learning constructed um, image of M87 that allows you to utilize the full resolution of the array. I want to emphasize there is no super resolution here. There is nothing that this algorithm generates past the point of where our largest baseline is. So where we don't have data, it of course doesn't make it up uh, in order to, uh, in order to create the image. So I will leave you with this um, coming a full circle from uh, obtaining the images to how we extracted um, quantitative measurements of the black hole space time um, using uh, simulation libraries and uh, theoretical techniques, and now making the images better uh, thanks to these simulation libraries. And I will take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So do we have questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you for this very nice talk, uh, which was very easy to understand even for somebody like me who knows nothing about uh, black holes. Yeah. It was a very nice presentation indeed. Uh, uh, I have a, a couple of questions related to the physics of the plasma flows that yes. you touched upon. Um, I know that uh, Narayan has done a lot of works in the 90s about the properties of uh, ADAPs and the other types. Of, so through your observations and your new models, can you say something more about the physics of the plasma? Is um, I understand that the ions are decoupled from the electrons. Do you have some idea about the temperature of the ions? And uh, if the density is sufficient to have, I know some people try to make nuclear, nuclear reactions within these flows. Do you have some idea about those conditions? And also last question about, um, in your simulations, do you see where, if there is a sign for a jet coming up of the disk at some point, is it far outside what you are studying or is it in that region? Okay, thank you. Indeed, um, some of the early work on these low luminosity or radiatively inefficient accretion flows happened in the 90s. Um, my advisor, Ramesh Narayan, uh, built um, some of the early, um, early hydrodynamics models for these uh, flows. 
it is a lot easier just from energy conservation point of view um, to calculate the ion temperature. The ions are hot, but because it's low density and cooling scales as density squared in, um, in these plasmas, they're unable to cool. So the ion temperatures are indeed high. What is unknown is what is the partition, how much of the heating goes into the electrons. And that's what sets the electron temperature. And some of this recent work that I showed you about MRI-driven turbulence and how it cascades down to the kinetic scales is about trying to get at what, what that partition is to the electron. So we are getting a little bit more um, physics-informed, uh, plasma-informed, um, information about how the electron heating might happen. Um, you, so th did that answer the, the very first question that you asked? The, 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 the ion temperatures are 10 to the 12 Kelvin, um, 10 to the 11 Kelvin. So um, the, the, there, I, I guess there could be, but again, um, it's, it's low density, um, so, um, our understanding of how much that could happen has not really changed because the ions are the anchor um, in, these, in these models anyway. Um, the other types of things that we're exploring now are the, uh, the impact of the long mean free paths. For example, when you do GRMHD, you're assuming that your, your plasma acts as a fluid. That is not really true. Um, because the collision rate is so low, the mean free paths of the electrons are, are quite large. The mean free paths of the ions are quite large. So does that introduce a temperature and isotropy when uh, an electron is able to move along field lines uh, much easier than, uh, than um, perpendicular to the field lines? And just the collisional mean free paths are low. So what are some of these kinetic effects that are, are, are showing up is what we are studying right now. You had one last part. The jet, thank you. Um, M87, of course, I should have shown it to you, um, has a very prominent jet that we've known about for decades. It's, uh, it's been studied in every wavelength possible. Sagittarius A star, to our knowledge, does not. We've looked in, again, every wavelength possible. There is no, there is no indication that Sagittarius A star has a collimated jet um, that, um, that resembles um, anything like what M87 or other jet sources have. In M87, interestingly, something that I didn't show you, we also have polarization maps and we have, uh, we have images at different wavelengths. So when you combine all of that, you can start asking yourself, for this uh, ring of light, how much is the jet contributing, how much is the flow contributing, it looks like the contribution from the flow is much larger than from the jet. Um, for Sag A star, that's all we have, it's just the contribution from the flow. But that's a very interesting question. Can HD be used to, to or uh, telescopes in that array? Um, can, can it be used to uh, understand jet launching a little better? What, what's the base of it um, and how much it does it contribute to the images. So that's actively being marked on. Thank you again for, for a clear and very informative talk. Um, and uh, I had one thing that I missed. You, you explained very well how you can use physics-based simulations to essentially constrain the solution either being by finding a ratio of radii between shadow and, and ring, or as a basis of function by a constrained basis to reconstruct the image. All of this was very clear. Sure. But this is, this is the, the thing I missed is the, to what extent the fact that the simulation cannot reproduce some of the facts which are really very real, which, which are the, the, very, the time variability, how does not, how does not, reflects on the uncertainty of the final image that because you are using simulations which you define as being uncertain or or at least missing some element so that's this connection that i that i missed do you could you say a few more words on this of course um yeah what is why what, what can i trust 
and what can I not trust and what is the relationship between the two? So one of the things, for example, the uh, covariant semi-analytic models are allowing us to do is really go crazy. We say, for example, let's, let's turn off heating at the ISCO and let, let the particles just follow geodesics on the way into the black hole. Uh, what, what would happen then? Let's change the electron to ion temperature ratio in, in ways that we don't think are physical, but uh, let's, let's explore that. Um, so we are able to, within the simulation library, explore a wide range of things that could have any impact on the image, on the steady state average image, and therefore constrain our uncertainties well that way. So if it turns out, for example, that the solution to the variability problem is that we allow the electron temperature to change very rapidly as a function of plasma beta, the uh, ratio of thermal to magnetic support um, in the plasma. Um, and we learn from that, oh, our electron heating models are failing in this way. We've already included that possibility as an ad hoc parametrization in the image library. So even though we don't hear, we go a little more crazy with the physics uh, when we explore the possibilities and measure uncertainties from that. The way you might say is that uh, you have more confidence that you have all the knots that ultimately will be needed to explain Evolution, even though you are doing it physically, but you have a knot. You are because of course you can only vary knots that you already have. That's so that's right. Confidence is that you have. Yes, I yes okay. exactly. Uh, yeah. I think there's one question over there. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. So I think my question is more about observations, and I was looking at these very sparsely filled UV planes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering. Is the limit like the number of baselines you can access or is it just observational time? Like, could you fill it more or? That, that's a very good question. Why is our coverage that sparse? Well, when you build an earth size array, it turns out two thirds of the earth being oceans is not in your favor. Um, the a number of telescopes that we can put in dry high places because 1.3 millimeter or even short word of that, it's even worse, really does not like moisture in the atmosphere. It is, it is corrupted by it. So the locations that, uh, that these telescopes that already existed and some that were commissioned after the fact are chosen by high altitude and uh, desert-like conditions. So, and uh, a lot of that on earth is already covered. Um, by the existing telescopes. Uh, there, there is a, a project to put a telescope in Namibia, and we could add a couple more, but it's, it's not going to drastically alter what we can do in terms of filling the Fourier space. Um, to do anything better, we would need to go to space, uh, where, of course, you don't have atmospheric uh, worries, and more importantly, for example, if you put a couple of telescopes in low Earth orbit, because it's a 90-minute uh, orbit around the Earth, it would fill in the UV space very quickly with just a few elements. Um, if you wanted to increase resolution, you would have to go to a high Earth orbit, go to maybe a, a, in a 2012 study, we showed that you could do about 30 more black holes if you went a third of the distance to the moon. So um, the fundamental limitation is uh, where you can put the telescopes and still get useful information that will actually make your image better as opposed to put one more telescope in Arizona. Sure, you could do that, but it's not going to get you much. So thank you for your talk, Fayel. Um, also very clear, I enjoyed it very much. So you mentioned at the end of the answers that um, most of the emission comes from the flows rather than from the jet. And uh, my question is, do your do your MHD calculations, can they produce jets? Because that's a very difficult issue, right? Yes. Um, yes. So by changing the initial magnetic field configurations, especially in the 
what I described as the mad versus sane, um, the amount of outflow and the amount of co collimation in that outflow, um, we can control it or not control it. We can we can have different outcomes, but there are also GRMHD simulations that um, that thread the, the inner flow with a particular type of magnetic field structure that more effectively collimates the jet. We've heard about these um, in these last four days. Um, so there are uh, not within the EHD in our uh, simulation library, we didn't have to my knowledge, uh, the, the particular uh, field structures that, that cause like very uh, strong collimations, but we certainly had outflows and various degrees of collimation. Thanks. Yeah. I wanted to follow up on the uh, question about the future of the HD. Yeah. Uh, forgetting about space, I mean, on Earth, there's, you mentioned Noema that will be added to the array, which is an important addition in sensitivity and also in the position where it is Absolutely. for the UV uh, coverage. But now we have measured beautiful two images of two systems. What are the prospects of measuring outers? And what are the prospects in going in higher angular resolution? Or I heard also of high frequency things, which will be much more difficult. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I wish I had, this is uh, a borrowed laptop for sad reasons, but um, I wish I had the, um, I could show you what we can do currently um, with the current EHD array or resolution that's uh, earth size um, diameter. Um, what other uh, jet sources we are already able to, like, uh, of course, I talked only about SAJ star and M87, but we've been studying about six other jet sources, not at the horizon scale, but at 10 Schwarzschild radii, 20 Schwarzschild radii scale. Um, their mass to distance combination allows us to access still the inner accretion flow and jet characteristics. There, um, there were really uh, striking results that, that came out about um, limb brightening in jets and uh, uh, kinks in jets, et cetera. So that's already part of the existing EHD uh, observing program. Um, but if we wanted to access more sources at the horizon scale, we have to go beyond the earth. Um, so these, these two are the ones where we can um, see evidence for the, the shadow. Your, the second part of your question was, how about a different wavelength? Indeed, um, going to a, a shorter wavelength is tougher. Uh, it, it makes data recording even tougher than what we have. We do a petabyte a night in, in the current array. Um, it, it's going, and we've increased the, the bandwidth to about double. So now if we go to uh, another wave band, we're, it's going to increase even more. Um, it makes the uh, moisture column uh, requirements in the atmosphere even more stringent, et cetera. Having said that, we have gone to 345 gigahertz in this last observing run in a handful of telescopes. So we are doing the proof of principle of correlating those data and, and looking at the impact of that somewhat higher resolution going from 230 gigahertz to 345 gigahertz. And on top of that, one thing that I like very much about this, this other wave band is that all the plasma processes that we're talking about are chromatic. So the properties of the image that, are, that arise from the plasma itself are going to change in two different wavelengths. Gravity effects are achromatic. So what is the imprinted space time versus what is painted on by the plasma um, is going to it's going to give us a whole other handle on on trying to uh, address that question. So, th three forty five is in the in the works, uh, but that's probably again the limit of what that's we can. Like do. a handful of the telescopes on the array. Um, more are being added. It's it's an ongoing. Um, so, I believe um, six telescopes in the array right now are 345 gigahertz ready, but don't quote me on that. I, I might be, I think uh, you're right. there, the, a lot of it is dual frequency um, already. So it's just a matter of being able to do the phasing in that shorter wavelength. 
and that's the 23rd, 2023 um, March campaign has 345 gigahertz data. Thank you. So fingers crossed. Thank you. I think it is time to close. So I would like to thank you again for your thank beautiful you. presentation.